the Austrian Circle. This is the program where we talk about the economics of freedom here on WHS Stores 91.7 FM. So thank you very much for tuning into my show this morning. We are going to be talking about one of my favorite topics out there, which is environmentalism. Now, oftentimes when people are talking about the free market or laissez-faire economics, they would say that uh, environmentalism is a huge problem. When you let the companies do whatever it is they want in order to provide the uh, lowest possible price to the customers, then they're going to pollute, they are going to you know, run uh, roughshod over the entire earth, they're going to deforest everything, they're going to chop down everything, they're going to kill all the animals, they're going to do, uh, you know, dump all their junk into the river, into the oceans, and, and all of this horrible, horrible stuff. And uh, so environmentalism is a really big topic for me. Because I know that this will not happen, given that there's a proper court structure and a proper libertarian attitude towards the invasion or aggression against other people and their property. You see, when someone is polluting, they are acting in aggression towards other people because they are taking uh, something which is a negative, let's say, you know, you know, uranium or some terrible waste product from their uh, productive process. And then they are dumping it into somebody else's property. So somebody else is affected by that. It's the same thing as if you walk into somebody's house and steal from them. Uh, They are now worse off than they were before and only because of your actions. And so when we understand libertarianism, when we understand that it is a non-aggression principle that is at the core of libertarian theory, then we understand that pollution is not a possibility for any of these companies. So I guess the first thing to talk about would be what manner of recourse would someone have if someone were invaded by pollution uh, by some company? And uh, we can imagine a scenario where you are out, and, and this actually happened in history too, uh, you are outside, you are hanging up your white linen uh, cloths on a clothesline, and you go inside, and you come back outside, and, and your nice white linens, all cleaned from your laundry machine, uh, they turn into black. They're just covered in soot and dust and, and garbage. And you look low on the horizon, and there's this you know, humongous company spewing black dust into the air through its uh, smokestacks. And so at this time, you would have likely had some sort of insurance previous to this incident actually occurring. So you would go inside and you would call your insurance company and say, hey, this guy is uh, uh, spewing black stuff all over the place and um, I have insurance. Can you guys do something about it? And so they would put pressure on this company to stop polluting. They would uh, maybe socially ostracize the person. They would go to the media and say, hey, this guy is violating our property rights. Or he might have already acted before this is occurring. Maybe the insurance company has already gone to this company and said, hey, we have clients in this area who have all sorts of um, policies that they have taken out in regards to pollution. So we don't want you to pollute. Uh, What kind of incentives can we offer you to not pollute in this area? And so it's really about the court systems. It's about some sort of a legal jurisdiction of these companies uh, coming in and saying, hey, there's an aggression being held against this um, uh, person who's out putting their clothes on the clothesline. And so the polluting company would likely find it more profitable to adhere to these social standards and, you know, invest in maybe some technology to reduce the amount of pollution. Maybe they'd move somewhere else. Maybe they'd think about their location a little bit more before they actually entered into the market in that particular area, rather than have to pay out claims to these individuals who are getting harmed because the insurance company is going to pay out claims to the people who are polluted against, and then they're going to go to this third party, you know, aggressive company and say, hey, you have to pay us now or else there's going to be some societal retribution. Again, maybe they'll uh, boycott their company or something like that. And so these are kind of some ways that the organizations in a free society could deal with the problems of pollution. And uh, again, this uh, example that I just gave was a historical context. This actually happened. And the court systems used to side in favor of the individuals who were harmed, just as the libertarian uh, non-aggression of property principle states that they should have. But a funny thing happened. The courts happened to get bought off by the large corporations. And of course, they sided then with the corporations claiming some societal good or social benefit or that the companies needed to pollute because, 
yada, yada, yada. You know, there's, there's always reasons behind the financial incentive of the exploiter because uh, anyone who claims to be able to aggress against a person's property and then pay no cost or restitution for those aggressions uh, is always an exploiter. And, you know, thinking that the government is going to protect the environment, I think is a little ridiculous. Uh, I mean, there's far too many empirical examples where they don't really care one iota about the environment. Uh, one is the development of these massive uh, nuclear weapons and crazy testing of these nuclear weapons in the uh, Nevada region. And uh, they, they recently bombed a island out in the Pacific and it had all sorts of, you know, rare species and stuff on it. Uh, they just blew it up. They, they just, they, well, we're going to test our weapons here. We're just going to blow stuff up and see what happens and who cares about the environment and what it does to it. And, you know, another example is uh, advocation of nuclear power plants. I'm not sure if this would be a technology that would be available in a free market. I think that the liability of it is, is uh, catastrophic. Uh, it's through the roof when these things collapse, as we can see by the recent Fukushima uh, disaster over in Japan. That's a, they're still dealing with this. They, they can't clean it up. There's uh, millions of dollars of man hours that are going into cleaning this stuff up. And it's still, you know, sending all this radiation out into the ocean and into the groundwater and all of this terrible stuff. I, I'm not sure, given the liability of what might happen if a radioactive nuclear power plant collapses, I'm not sure that that's a liability that the market is willing to bear. But the government's just like, okay, yeah, sure, just build all this stuff that might, you know, destroy the whole uh, environment. Uh, let's build all these nuclear bombs and then, you know, threaten Russian armies with them so that we might cause a nuclear war that might destroy the entire planet. Um, you know, the, go the government also approved of that uh, super collider. I don't know if you've heard of that thing, but it's a government science um, based research plant. And what they do is they slam atoms together very strongly and uh, create reactions that uh, might actually lead to the production of a black hole. A black hole would be the end of our entire planet. Our whole galaxy <laughs> pretty much would be enveloped in this black hole that scientists have created here on the planet. Again, that's a humongous liability that I think insurance companies would be like, whoa, whoa, hey, hey hold on a second. You want to build what? Something that can create a black hole and, and destroy all of our clients and, and the entire planet? That, that's preposterous. You are going to have to travel to a couple of galaxies that way if you want to build this crazy super collider thing that you want to research the uh, god particle or whatever it is that you're researching. Go over there, not where our clients are. But again, government is just like, do whatever you want. Just build all these things that it might cause the end of the planet. I mean, you know, that's fine. <laughs> and again, it's because they don't really bear any responsibility or any liability for when uh, anything that they do damages people or their property. They're not paying out claims in the same way that insurance companies would. So I'm kind of talking about environmentalism here on the Austrian Circle today because I saw a movie last week called Cowspiracy. Uh, it's a kind of indie film. It wasn't really widely produced and widely distributed, but I, I thought it was a good movie. They raised a number of very good points, although I, I'm not sure about their solutions. Again, they're not really free market oriented, so I don't think that they really came up with the property oriented solutions that we're talking about on this show. However, the movie raised, again, a lot of really good points. And uh, one of the points was the deforestation that the cattle and uh, cow business uh, causes, especially in Brazil. We see the deforestation of the rainforest down there where the cattle companies are just grabbing up land and they're, they need to expand a, a lot of the land. I, I heard a statistic that 24% uh, of the planet is used towards cattle production. They just need a, a ton of land uh, to produce as much meat as people are consuming. And so in Brazil, uh, this is happening where they're, they're taking over the rainforest uh, at, at quite a alarming rate. And um, this is all because of the government, though. The government owns the Brazilian rainforest, and they say, hey, cattle companies, uh, come over here. You guys can use this as long as you give us a ton of money and you get us reelected and like all of this stuff, all the normal political uh, stuff. And so we see the deforestation of these lands. And when you get common property, you get this grabbing up of resources. You don't get a privately uh, profit-based understanding that your 
income, that your livelihood comes from this property. Now, if uh, private companies owned the rainforest and some cattle company came along and said, hey, we've got to gobble up this land for our cattle, the rainforest owning company would assess the value of their property, how much income it was getting uh, for them, and they would also assess the value that it was giving to other people. So uh, people around the world like the rainforest, uh, people around the world like water, they like oxygen, they like uh, you know all of the things that the trees give to us. So they might contribute to this company and say, hey, keep the rainforest you know, rainforesty. We don't really want them uh, with the cattle on it. The cattle stuff we don't really want. Rain rainforest we do want. So we're going to give you money uh, in terms of donations or, or you know, dollars or whatever, and uh, keep the rainforest the way they are. And so that company is going to assess how much value people are appropriating towards the rainforest versus how much the cattle companies are wanting to gobble up that land. And, and that's not how it works right now. Now the cattle companies just uh, you know, buy it for pennies on a dollar because they are buying off the politicians who own the land. And this happens here in America too. The Bureau of Land Management is often bought off by the uh, cattle companies to kill off the predators of the cows. They use the government resources to go in and uh, you know attack any predators, kill off the wolves, you know all of that stuff. So it's the same kind of corruption that occurs around the world. You get that with any political center that can be bought off by corporations. Another really good point that the movie raised, and uh, this we're talking about the Cowspiracy movie that was just recently released as a documentary, and they were talking about the oceans and how the oceans are being over-harvested and that the, uh, the people who are out fishing don't really care about other species. They, let's say they just want the tuna while well, they gather up all the whales and all the sharks and all the starfish and all the stuff that people like. They just grab it into one big net and, you know, if there's a bunch of extra stuff left in there, they just take the tuna out, they kill everything else, and they don't really care. Again, it's not their property. It's commonly owned. And we had Walter Block on the show talking about the privatization of oceans and waterways, his new book. And privatizing the oceans would give an incentive for people not to overuse resources. Let's say that somebody actually owned some of those sharks and whales and all of those things that got caught in the nets. Well, they would be very upset and they would be able to appeal to some sort of court system that would validate their property ownership and the tuna people would then become the invaders. They would become the aggressors because they don't actually own the sharks. They don't own the whales. It's not up to them to go and harvest them because it's not their property. And so in that case, they would have to maybe use more targeted methods of fishing. Would they not be able to fish as much? Sure. Would the price of the fish go up? Sure. But we would ensure that property rights were taken into consideration and that they were adhered to by these organizations going forward, and then we would have less of this uh, dispute. We also wouldn't have this over-harvesting, because when you own something, you want to take care of it. You want to look at the long-term profitability of that thing. So, you know, if we're talking about deforestation, if I own a forest, and I just go in and I chop down all the trees, and I just lay barren the entire forest that I've just bought, it's now decreased in value so much that it's probably unrecoverable. There, there's no way that I could ever bring it back to the value it was that I bought it at. So what I want to do is I want to rotate the forest. Maybe I'll chop down a couple trees here, then I'll replant them, and then I'll go over to the other side and I'll chop down a couple trees there. I don't know. I'm not really a logger or a forester, but I know that you would want to rotate your crop. You would want to work towards the longevity of it. And because you own it, you have an incentive to do so. But when you don't own something, it's like a free-for-all. You just run in there, you grab as much as you can, you take it all out of the ocean, and then you leave nothing behind because there's nothing in the long term that you're going to be able to profit off of by uh, fertilizing the ocean, by making sure the fish are well fed, by making sure that they're breeding properly. You know, that, that all goes out the window when you have a kind of common property ownership. So I hope that you've been enjoying this. This is the Austrian Circle. We are 91.7 FM. We're broadcasting out of Mansfield Stores, Connecticut, and we are talking about environmentalism here on the show. Again, I saw a movie called uh, Cowspiracy recently, which kind of prompted me to do this show on environmentalism. And uh, one of the points that the movie raised that I thought was very important was the excessive resource consumption, particularly for uh, beef and cattle. 
Now, um, it seems that grain beef production takes over 100,000 liters of water for every kilogram of food. Uh, broiler chickens is only 3,500 liters of water to make a kilogram of meat, by comparison. And uh, soybean production is only 2,000 liters uh, per kilogram. Uh, rice is also 2,000 liters per kilogram. Wheat is only 900 liters per kilogram, and potatoes are 500 liters per kilogram. Again, compared to 100,000 liters of water per kilogram. And a lot of that is, goes into the grain that is uh, fed to these animals. Over half the water consumed in the United States is used to grow grain for cattle feed. Just for the feed that the animals then eat, half of the water used in the U.S. is growing grain for this cattle. Uh, animal farms use nearly 40% of the world's total grain production. In the United States, nearly 70% of grain production is fed to livestock. That's an incredible amount of resources, and this is not reflected to consumers in the way that prices are relayed to consumers. Uh, prices are meant to show you the scarcity of how many resources we're consuming when we're actually bringing something to the table. Uh, it shows you the relative scarcity. It shows you how much people want it. It shows you a lot of different pieces of information which are absent in our current market because we have the government distorting the market. And the movie didn't actually go into this, but I'm going to explain it to you because I am very familiar with this process. So the government subsidizes massive quantities of grain in the United States. Uh, they send all sorts of money to farmers to grow all this grain for the cattle, which, pr which lowers the price of grain. And so the cattle companies are buying up all this low-priced grain because the government is subsidizing it. And so they are able to then bring low-priced beef into the market. The prices go down the chain all the way to the supermarket where you are going to buy the beef. But it's that initial subsidization that really causes the distortion of prices that then flows down to the customer, uh, masking what the actual resource cost of raising beef is. Uh, if you didn't have that subsidy, you would actually see the real cost of how many resources were being consumed in the production of cattle. So it's the government that's distorting this. They are uh, taking money from everybody. They take money from the veg vegans, from the vegetarians, the people who don't eat meat, you know, all of these people. They take that money and then they lower the price of grain and then they either dump it on the third world, which ruins their local markets, or they feed it all to the cattle, which again reduces the price of beef. And people then overconsume the beef because it's such a low price. It seems like it's such a bargain. Uh, people on average eat about 200 pounds of meat in this country. And that's a, what I would think is much larger amount than what would be if the real cost, if the real price of how many resources went into producing that beef was actually shown and revealed to the customer who was going to buy the beef. Um, water is another good example where the government distorts the market and causes the price to be lower than it otherwise would have been. Uh, government owns all of the water production facilities, all, all of the water supply organizations, and so therefore sets the price for water at below what the market would actually charge. And again, this price would then be uh, seen in the market based on the beef prices because the consumer would then know how many resources were going into the production of beef and would then be able to change their choices uh, for their consumption habits accordingly based on the actual resource cost that the cattle are uh, bringing about because of their need for food and water and all of that stuff. But the government distorts this by not allowing the customer to see the resource consumption of these cattle. And they do that by setting the price for water at zero or near zero. And so the cattle producers don't pass that information down to the customer. Uh, California recently is going through a massive drought. And so I wanted to read you an article about uh, how water might be produced on the market and what market prices might reveal to customers about information regarding water and water consumption. So this article was posted on the Foundation of Economic Education. It is by Howard Better Jr. And it's called Liquid Assets. Quote, wow, 4.30 a gallon for premium said my wife as we drove past a gas station this summer. I had read the previous day that gasoline was in relatively short supply, amid uncertainty about oil production in Iraq. In California especially, gasoline supplies have been tight for several reasons, including California's strict rules on vehicle emissions. 
And yet there were no lines at the Shell station, and no one stopped my wife and me to investigate how much gasoline we were using or the purpose of the car trips we were using it for. Both in Maryland, where we live, and across the country in California, drivers are allowed to buy as much gasoline as they want every day of the week, if they wish, and use it on any purposes they choose. No one checks up on anybody to make sure that gasoline goes to its most important uses. No one frets that we'll all burn so much gasoline for unimportant purposes that we'll have none left for important purposes. With water in California now, things are different. The Wall Street Journal reported this summer on the work being done in California these days to make sure that the limited supplies of water there are being used sensibly. Like most western states outside the Pacific Northwest, California is naturally dry. Even in average years, it gets less rain and snowfall than necessary to provide everybody there with all the water they'd like. And periodically, like now, it suffers droughts when there is even less water to go around. In response to the drought, the Wall Street Journal says inspectors are traveling around residential areas checking on water use. In many areas, certain uses of water, such as for watering lawns or washing cars, are prohibited or else allowed only on a few days of the week. Neighbors monitor and report on their wa neighbor's water use, and occasionally the water authorities fine people who use too much water or use it in unapproved ways. Despite all the restrictions, informing and fines, there is still real concern that Californians will run out of water for important uses. Indeed, there is not enough water now to irrigate all of California's crops. About 400,000 acres of cropland sit idle. The contrast between the allocation of gasoline and the allocation of water in the West presents a puzzle. Here are two valuable goods, both insufficient in quantity, to satisfy all the uses people have for them. In that, they are alike. But how we determine who uses how much of each and for what purposes is very... Why? What's the underlying difference? At root, the difference is that gasoline is privately owned, while water is government-owned. Hence, gasoline is freely bought and sold on competitive markets, while water is sold by government agencies with local monopolies. This makes all the difference. Gasoline is bought and sold at competitive market prices, while water is sold at government set prices. That's why the gasoline market is orderly and the water market is disorderly. The necessary foundations of economic order, private ownership, and free exchange are lacking for water. Hence, water markets lack market prices, those precious signals that tell us what to do to stay well coordinated with others. Consider the $4.30 a gallon for premium that my wife remarked on. That price tells a story to all who see it. About 20 cents a gallon higher than it was a few weeks before, it told us that the amount of premium being produced was a bit less relative to the amount people want than it was a few weeks before. It does not tell us why. It might be that less was being produced or that more was desired, perhaps for fueling SUVs for, SUVs for uh, family vacations, but it does tell us that for some reason each additional gallon of gasoline was worth more that day than it used to be. Every possible use of premium gasoline that's not worth at least $4.30 a gallon, or whatever the price might be in the local area, gets screened out, eliminated, effectively prohibited by that market price. There again is the magic of spontaneous, unplanned, astonishingly smooth and orderly operation of the market price system. When market prices rise, without an order being given, thousands of people cut back on their consumption. They stop using gasoline for less important purposes. It's a marvel. Now what about water in drought-stricken states? Water prices are set by, quote, authorities at arbitrary prices that don't change to reflect water availability. The authorities allocate water to various uses. But how can the Water Resource Control Board know which purposes are most important, and most important to whom? Are a few more strawberries more important than keeping the lawn and garden green? Doesn't that depend on whether the strawberries are more important to those who eat them than the beauty of the lawn and garden are important to the homeowner? 
how can the water board make that judgment? And might a car buff not care so ardently about keeping his car spotless that using the water to wash his car is actually more important to him than either the strawberries or the freshness of the lawn and garden? How can a government agency know the importance of all possible uses of water to all possible users? The short answer is that it can't. So is there any way for society to make sure water does go to the uses people consider most important? Yes, there is. Use market prices as with gasoline. Get governments out of the water business. Let private individuals and companies own, supply, buy, and sell water in pursuit of profit so that market prices for water emerge. The more scarce the water, the more the private owners will be able to charge for it. As prices rise, every water user whose importance can't justify that water's price gets eliminated, according to the values of the person contemplating it. That use is now, quote, prohibitively expensive. We don't need bureaucrats to prohibit unimportant water uses any more than we need them to prohibit unimportant uses of gasoline. Free market prices under private ownership and supply can do that for us. That article was by Howard Baker Jr., and it was posted on the Foundation of Economic Education, FEE.org. And so the author here raises a really great point about resource consumption. Uh, prices tell us information about the scarcity of whatever good that we're talking about. As the supply of that good diminishes, then the price of that good is going to rise. And it also tells us about the demand, how much people actually want that good uh, relative to other things that they might be buying in the economy. And so prices fluctuate based on supply and demand. And uh, it also creates an incentive for new producers to try and think of new solutions. So when the price of water is rising in California, maybe somebody in Colorado uh, gets the great idea that they can melt all of the snow and truck it over with a bunch of trucks and make sure that uh, the Californians have enough water for themselves. And they do so because of the profitability of the newfound prices. Uh, when prices rise, that creates an incentive for new profit. Uh, people realize that now it's profitable to truck a bunch of water into California, whereas when water is set at zero or near zero prices by the government, there's literally no incentive for any company to try and uh, truck things over to come up with new solutions. Maybe they'll build a big slide that uh, slides the ice into California. I mean, who knows? There's so many solutions that the market could come up with for resources and resource consumption. And in the case of cattle, people would actually realize the full price of the resources that they're consuming. And uh, to me, that's the way that we conserve the resources of the planet. We show people the actual scarcity of those resources through market prices. So environmentalism is not something absent in libertarianism. We are very keen on conserving the environment and making sure that the planet is not polluted. We just say that the government can't do it. We need property rights, we need market prices, and we need liberty. I hope that you enjoyed this presentation. This has been the Austrian Circle here on 91.7 FM. I hope that you tune in next week for another episode here at 11 o'clock in the morning. Have a great week. Take care.